We are back again with On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm your host, Newsom, and we're back at the Apex in Vegas for UFC Vegas 30. This event is headlined by two surging goliaths in the UFC heavyweight division, as we have the current heavyweight hype train Cyril Gann versus the six foot seven Russian veteran Alexander Volkov. I love this fight because the matchmaking is perfect and one fighter is about to catapult themselves into a potential title shot, whilst the other will be taking two steps back. Backwards. Honestly, there's a lot at stake here because both fighters have worked really hard to be in the position that they're in, but only one man can win this fight. But just before we get into the breakdowns, as always, there's a few things to mention in regards to MMA Play 365. The last event was a bit better than the previous two, but we still fell slightly short on the night. The Korean Zombie versus Ige was a very strange fight that played out so oddly that watching tape on the fight was almost pointless. So we dropped a bet there. We did, however, cash a really solid ticket with one of my favourite prospects right now, with Sung Wu Choi knocking out Arosa in round one. The two pre-made parlays were also razor close to winning as well. Small margins on a difficult event. But the great thing about this sport is there is no off-season and we go again next week. Remember, we have multiple packages on the MMA Play 365 website for all the UFC betting advice and DraftKings fan duel advice that you'll ever need. We also have various subscription lengths and options too, so to see our full service list, please go and visit MMAPlay365.com for more information or to sign up today. And let's go, let's break down some fights in the main event. In the heavyweight division, we've got Cyril Gann versus Alexander Volkov. Gann is currently the minus 165 favourite, the comeback on Volkov at plus 145 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with the underdog in Volkov. I think that this fight and the betting line should be much closer to a pick'em. And that isn't me saying that I'm not on this hype train with Cyril Gann. I love Cyril Gann and I think he is a super interesting prospect. And this is a big test for him, but that's the key thing here. It's a really big test and one that I think should make the betting lines much closer. So, like I say, I think the value's with the plus money on Alexander Volkov. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, there's been a lot of fluctuation already. We've seen Volkov up at plus 160 then we've seen him drop back down to plus 130 so there's definitely money coming in on both sides and it's almost like each fighter has their points of where people will bet them so when Volkov is up at plus 150 plus 160 people are seeing a lot of value there betting him back down but then as soon as Gan gets too low people are back on that hype train and betting Gan which is widening the line again so I ultimately think this is going to continue throughout fight week and I do think that eventually the more money will come in on Volkov. I think Volkov will close at around plus 130 with Gan roughly around minus 150 as they step into the cage on Saturday night. So as for how this fight plays out, like I've already said in the introduction to the podcast, I really like this fight. I think stylistically they match up really well. You've got Volkov, six foot seven striker, a technical striker. He's patient. He's not a big heavyweight brawler that will go in looking for that one bomb knockout shot. Although he has started sitting down on his strike lately which I like a lot and I also really like Volkov a lot you know he cashed a max bet for me against Overeem five units just a few months ago that was my first max bet in about two years I think it was so like I say I'm a real fan of Volkov and I appreciate him cashing me that max bet ticket but here he's got a different beast in front of him with Cyril Gann and again similar to Volkov Gann isn't a fighter that's going to go out there and look to take his opponent's head off with one shot he's very technical he's got a Muay Thai background he takes his time he'll switch stances he'll come forward methodically methodically and he'll just pick away and pick away until he can like Volkov start sitting down on his shots when he gets his reads and he starts seeing openings that's when he'll really take advantage and if he doesn't see many holes or many openings he's just happy just peppering away like he did against Rosenstroik and just taking a decision win and then when you look at the ground game of both fighters as well both fighters have got decent wrestling they don't use it so much offensively Gan maybe a little bit more than Volkov but again the sample size is small however defensively they're both really good they can both grab as well both grappling well defensively is another good point to make because if either fight is taken down they can get back up to the feet and this is actually a really important point to make because Cyril Gann's been talking pre-fight about how he wants to show his well-rounded game in this fight he wants to show that he's improved his wrestling and his grappling so you never really know if a fighter's talking truths when they're saying things like that before a fight and you do have to take that sort of stuff with a pinch of salt but 
look at last weekend with Korean Zombie. They were talking about the wrestling and the grappling pre-fight. I didn't think anything of it. And he went out there and he did exactly that. So maybe Gan will come into this fight and look for takedowns. But I've seen Volkov get taken down by better wrestlers in Curtis Blades. I've seen Volkov stand back up constantly. That was a five-round fight as well. He was taken down in every single round. He was still fresh. He was still okay come round five as well. And actually, the longer the fight went on, the better Volkov became so if Gan comes into this fight and starts taking him down and trying to grapple him I don't think Volkov's going to have too many issues this is also a man that had Fabrizio Verdum on top of him as well so I don't think that Gan's going to present too many threats on the mat if he does start to wrestle and grapple Volkov I think this fight is going to be won and lost on the feet because I don't think Volkov's going to look to take Gan down either that's just not his style and I think on the feet in regards to volume in regards to getting hit this is definitely Gan's biggest test by an absolute mile Volkov is a veteran in mixed martial arts a 30 33 and 8 record something that I touched upon just a few moments ago as well as the sample size of Gan and that's because Gan's 8 and 0 he's 8 and 0 fighting a 33 and 8 veteran now what that doesn't mean is that Volkov is head and shoulders a better fighter but what it does mean is the gap in experience is absolutely huge in this fight Volkov's been in there so many times against top quality competition over so many years and although I don't think you can put too much stock into that I think at some point you have to take that into consideration because Gan's fighting somebody that's massively experienced it's Gan's biggest test of his career the best fighter that he's ever fought and Volkov has fought other really tough world-class heavyweights so I definitely think you've got to take it into consideration somewhat and for me the way I'm looking at this experience gap is I feel that like I've already said the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet there might be a bit of wrestling and grappling from Gan but I think the better work's going to be done on the feet and it's going to be really close I don't think that any fighter is going to start running away with this fight with the strikes landed with hard punches landed I think both fighters are going to be fighting back and forth both fighters are technical both fighters will be patient looking for the timing looking to get the reads down and looking to enter range land the shots exit back out of range I think it's going to be a really technical fight and yes one fighter might end up getting knocked out either fighter could get knocked out it's the heavyweight division both fighters hit hard so one clean punch could be all she wrote but I do think for the most part that this fight is going to be technical it is going to be close and it's just with Volkov having that big gap in experience of him being in there so many times seeing this situation so many times the fact that Gan's got his biggest test and the best quality opponent that he's ever fought in mixed martial arts and it does just edge me over to lean towards Alexander Volkov winning this fight and like I said in the introduction it's not as if I'm saying that I'm not on this Cyril Gan hype train I think Gan is a phenomenal fighter and a fighter with a big future ahead of him his ceiling's ridiculously high he's going to be up there he's going to be challenging for titles and he could beat Volkov here but we see it time and time again when the hype train that's surging through the division 5-0, 6-0, 7-0, 8-0, still quite raw and early in the mixed martial arts career and they're going against a fighter that's been at the top of the division for absolutely years and then they just fall short because the test is too big at that moment but these losses that the surging fighters the hype trains take is actually great for the career because it gives them something to look back on and learn from and come back better and I honestly think that we're going to see that happen in this fight I think the test at this moment is just going to be a little too much for Gan but Gan's going to learn from it come back and then make another surge up the division maybe rematch Volkov further down the line and maybe take that win in the rematch then but for now for right now I am going to be siding with the experienced Alexander Volkov to win this fight and in the next fight in the co-main event again in the heavyweight division we've got Ovin St. Pru versus Tanner Boza. Boza's currently the minus 170 favourite the comeback on OSP at plus 150 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line I do think even though this is a short notice fight for Boza and he's not really had much preparation that the line is probably quite accurate and if you are going to push me for a value side I probably would say that Boza at minus 170 is a better bet still than OSP at plus 150. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I do think the line's going to continue to get wider. The current trend is the money in on Boza. The line was a little bit shorter a couple of days ago, but I agree with the trend. I agree with the money coming in on Boza. I do think that continues, but I don't think we see it get to minus 200. I think that'll be a little bit too disrespectful for OSP. 
I think that Boza is going to step into the cage at around minus 175, minus 180 on fight night with OSP roughly plus 155, plus 160. Now, as for how this fight plays out, it's great to see OSP return up to heavyweight where he last fought Ben Rothwell. And to be honest with you, I didn't really give OSP much credit before that fight because I just didn't know how he was going to look at heavyweight but he actually looked okay he packed the size on he didn't get too heavy so he was still light on his feet he was fast he had a lot of volume you could tell that the weight cut or the lack of weight cut definitely improved OSP's performance his cardio looked okay and the main thing with a fighter stepping up into the heavyweight division is what does his chin look like getting hit by a much bigger harder man and he was getting cracked by Ben Rothwell who is a very big heavyweight and OSP looks like he could eat the shot so I'm not concerned with OSP going up to heavyweight in regards to durability and his physique and just overall how he looks in a division where you can weigh 265 pounds but the concern I do actually have for OSP is just the opponent in front of him in Tanner Boza I know Boza's not had much preparation for for this fight but I don't think to beat OSP with the style that Boza has that he needs a full eight week fight camp where he's got everything in order full preparation and that's no disrespect to OSP it's more a reflection of Tanner Boza his skill set and like I've already said the style versus style matchup here I think that Boza is just a really active heavyweight. He's got good movement. He's not going to be up at 265 pounds himself. So the weight's actually going to be close between both fighters. And I just think that the volume and the durability and the fact that Boza can walk through fire to land his own shots is going to be enough to push OSP back, to put the pressure on OSP, make OSP really start moving on the back foot often, potentially even turtle OSP up as well against the cage. And that's how we've seen OSP beaten a lot in his career. When OSP can come forward, when he can control the pace of the fight and dictate the range, that's when OSP is really good. But Bose is just not going to allow for that. If OSP tries to come forward, Bose will just meet him in the middle. He'll eat a few punches if he needs to, land a few hard punches back and just keep pushing forwards. And one man will have to move backwards in that scenario. And I just don't think Bose will be the man taking the step backwards. And that's going to be the key factor in this fight. So ultimately, I think Bose going to be pushing OSP backwards, he's going to be landing decent numbers in volume, he's going to be mixing his attacks up as well from body shots, head shots, kicks to the legs, kicks to the body and OSP will be trying to mix things up as well but it's going to be much harder for OSP to get going and get his volume going whilst he's moving backwards. I think that's where Bose is going to cause problems. If this fight does go three rounds, if we do hit the scorecards, I just think Bose is going to have landed more volume. He's going to be the fighter moving forwards. He's going to be the aggressor. He'll just be looking better in the judges' eyes. But I also think Bose could potentially get a late finish here as well. You know, really tire OSP out because it is going to be a tiring job if OSP is constantly on the back foot. And although I honestly don't think this is going to be a whitewash for Bose, I do think OSP is going to have his moments in this fight. It's not going to be all one Way traffic I am picking Tanaboza to win this fight and in the next fight we've got the people's main event we've got my favorite fight on the fight card absolutely we've got Hayoni Barcelos versus Timor Valiev Barcelos is currently the minus 210 favorite the comeback on Valiev at plus 175 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line I do think the line's too wide. I think the value's on the underdog in Timor Valiev. The thing is, this fight could potentially be really close. Either fighter has got a really good chance of winning this fight. And I can almost guarantee I'm convinced that the betting line will not be a reflection of how this fight plays out. I think the fight's going to play out much closer than the betting line suggests. And that's why I think that Timor Valiev with the plus 175 next to his name, is the value side in this fight. And as for where the betting lines move throughout fight week, I actually don't think they're going to move too much. I don't think it's going to ping off in any direction. I think the line's quite settled and people tend to be happy with it. People that are massively on Hayoni Barcelos are going to see value at minus 210. But people that do see this fight as being much closer and appreciate that Valiev is absolutely a phenomenal fighter is going to see value at that plus 175 line so I think there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation both ways I do think there's going to be a little bit of money swing either side but come fight night on Saturday night I expect the betting lines to be sitting roughly where they're at right about now so as for how this fight plays out I'm so excited for this fight and like I say in regards to the betting line I am quite surprised it's this wide I did expect it to be much closer and I love Hayoni Barcelos. I think he's an absolute beast. He's a monster and he's very difficult to beat. And that's something that you have to take into consideration when you're breaking down any Barcelos fight because 
how do you beat Barcelos? You've got to be good everywhere. You've got to be aggressive. You've got to be able to fight on the back foot as well. You've got to be able to pour on volume. You've just got to be comfortable wherever the fight goes, moving forwards and moving backwards. And the thing is, that describes Timor Valiev. Sure, Valiev had a setback in his UFC debut against Trevin Jones, but before Valiev was just caught with that one punch and knocked out. He was looking phenomenal. He was really pouring it on Trevin Jones. He was ripping everywhere to the legs, to the body, to the head. His movement's great. The angles that he takes up is phenomenal as well. He's just a ball of energy inside the cage. He's got good training partners, likes of Frankie Edgar, Marlon Marias, along with some of his fellow Russians like Zabit Magomed Sharipov, Movlid Kaibalaev, Askar Askarov. The dude has got so many good training partners to train with that it's no wonder he's getting better and just improving the qualities that he already has. And like I said, the qualities that are going to cause Barcelos problems. So you look at Barcelos and what does he bring to the table? Well, he brings forward pressure. He brings aggression. He brings durability. He's also, in my opinion, the likely fighter or the more likely fighter to really mix things up inside the cage. So although Valiev does have takedowns and he can score takedowns and he's got a good top game, he's got good jiu-jitsu as well. I think if anybody's really mixing this fight up and looking to take it into a different direction, then it's going to be Hayoni Barcelos. I think Barcelos has got good wrestling and he's also got really good Brazilian jiu-jitsu himself to the point where even though I think Valiev's okay, if Barcelos does get on top of Valiev and he can get on top of him often, then he can at the very least just establish a top control position and just start winning minutes of the rounds, potentially try and submit Valiev, which I don't think is out the question at all but at the very least just control Valiev on the mat if there's no finish just win the round and move on to the next I think that's going to be Barcelos's best path to victory in my opinion because although I think Barcelos has more power in his strikes and he will be the one landing the bigger action strikes I think Valiev is just going to be the more active fighter throughout the fight I think he's going to be throwing more volume mixing things up up and down the body just using a diverse variety of attacks that's going to cause Cause Barcelos problems that he's going to make Barcelos see things that he's not seen before from any of his other previous opponents. I think Valiev is his biggest test in the UFC to date, and likewise, I think Barcelos is Valiev's biggest test as well. So, this is why it's such a good fight. I think that Valiev should be able to keep the fight on the feet. I do think Barcelos can score takedowns, but if Valiev just scrambles instantly and gets straight back up, then Barcelos isn't the type of fighter that's going to be shooting five or six takedowns per fight he'll probably shoot one or two he'll see how it feels and if Valiev can really just get back up to his feet early in this fight from the first or the second takedown then it might put Barcelos off from shooting relentlessly it'll keep the fight standing Barcelos will still have a good chance of winning himself landing a big power shot that could potentially knock Valiev out but Valiev's creativity and his volume and his movement is just so difficult to deal with that I find it hard to imagine that Barcelos can stay striking with Valiev and win the fight based on attrition, based on volume. I just think Valiev's going to be too good, too creative, too fast inside there. And I'm not saying that Barcelos is slow. This is more, again, a reflection on how good Valiev is. I don't think he's given the credit that he deserves. I do think this path to victory for Barcelos. I think the wrestling could potentially be a problem. And then the topside jiu-jitsu, he could potentially knock Valiev out on the feet with a power shot. But I do think that the majority of the better work in this fight is going to be done on the feet. Therefore, I think the fight is going to be won and lost from a striking perspective. And I'm just going to favour the fighter that I believe is more creative, with more volume, with better movement. And he's likely going to be the faster fighter as well. For those reasons, I'm picking Timor Valiev to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Andre Feely versus Daniel Pineda. Feely's currently the minus 225 favourite, the comeback on Pineda at plus 185 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the betting line's quite accurate. And to be honest, I love Andre Feely and I'm a little bit disappointed that he's up at minus 225. I'd have loved him if he was at minus 175 or maybe minus 160, that sort of range. I'd have loved to play him then, but at minus 225, I feel that the bookies have got this one right. 
if you are going to push me for a value side, it could be a little bit closer than the betting line suggests. I do think, though, that Andre Feely is going to win. So at minus 225, I would say that Feely is still probably the better bet than Daniel Pineda at plus 185. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I don't think it's going to move too much, if I'm being honest. I'd be surprised if Feely dropped under minus 200. I'd also be surprised if Andre Feely went to minus 250. So I think there'll be a little bit of fluctuation either side. But ultimately, come fight night on Saturday night, I expect the betting lines to be sitting roughly where they are right about now. And as for how this fight plays out, I've already dropped the spoiler that I do think that Andre Feely wins this fight. And I'll explain why. I just think that Andre Feely, again, similar to what I mentioned with Valiev, just not on that level. I think Feely's quite creative in his strategy. Bikes. He's also very well-rounded himself, so he's got an underrated wrestling game. He will shoot takedowns. I do think Pineda can be taken down. I don't discredit Pineda's jiu-jitsu, though. I think his Brazilian jiu-jitsu is really good, so Feely's got to be careful on the map. But the thing is, Feely's jiu-jitsu is good as well, and he's not the type of fighter that's going to be liable to get caught in an armbar or a triangle from bottom. He's just too good for that, so I feel that if Feely can get on top of Pineda, then he's not going to have too many issues. Pineda might get back up to his feet once or twice. Feely's not got the heaviest top control game, but Feely can just keep reshooting the takedowns if he wants to. However, I don't think he's necessarily going to have to in this fight because I think that Feely's the better striker. He's quicker. He has more variety with the strikes that he throws, mixing to the legs, to the body, switching stances, which he's really good at as well. He can fight well both as a southpaw and orthodox as well. So I think Feely's got a lot of advantages in this fight, and that's why the betting line is accurate where it's sitting right now. And for me, for Pineda to win this fight, is either going to have to flash finish Feely with a quick submission or just land that one punch that counts to knock him out or Pineda's going to have to make this fight really close really scrappy I just don't think Pineda is going to be in a situation where he can run away with this fight and make it decisive so he either flash finishes Feely or it goes to a very close decision which Pineda might lose anyway so I do think that Feely's in a good spot in this fight I think Feely could potentially run away with this fight not look absolutely like a minus 400, minus 500 favourite. But just when you're looking at the individual rounds, you're like, yeah, Feely capped that round off. And then, yeah, Feely capped the second round off and the third round off. And it just becomes a fight that's a pretty simple 30-27 to score. Or even a pretty simple 29-28 can be a dominant fight. You know, Feely dropping around, but then just being really good in the other two. So that's where I'm seeing this fight. I think Feely's simply just going to be the better fighter wherever this fight goes. And I do think that that's going to matter on the night. I'm picking Andre Feely to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a great fight that's been put together. We've got Nicholas Dolby versus Tim Means. Now, Tim Means was supposed to fight Danny Roberts last week, but Danny Roberts pulled out. Nicholas Dolby was supposed to fight Sergi Kandosko this week. Kandosko pulled out, so the UFC just made this fight, and I actually really like it. Tim Means is currently the minus 130 favourite. The comeback on Dolby at plus 110 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits with the favourite in Tim Means at minus 130. I think the line should be a little a bit wider it opened a little bit wider and I sort of agreed with that and thought that was a more accurate betting line but a lot of money's come in on Dolby that was the current trend it's closed the line up a bit and pushed means into that value side in my opinion as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week like I've just said the current trend is the money coming in on Dolby obviously Tim Means last night had a little bit of pushback I did see him down at minus 120 but he's up at minus 130 now so a bit more money's coming in Tim Means that tells me there's going to be a bit of fluctuation throughout fight week ultimately when they step into the cage on Saturday night I think they're going to be roughly sitting where they are right about now because I just don't see the line pinging off in the direction of Dolby or Means. Now as for how this fight plays out like I said it's a really good fight I'm really looking forward to it but it pains me to say I'm just not convinced with Dolby's record in the UFC and I'll talk about that a little bit like I said it pains me to say because he comes across as a really nice guy if you've ever spoken to him on social media or met him he does come across like a really good human being so he does does hurt me to talk about it in this way but I'm just analysing fights and just simply giving my opinion on what I see inside the cage so with Nicholas Dolby his last win against Daniel Rodriguez I think he was very fortunate to get that win he was out volumed and I was surprised that it was a unanimous decision at least a split. I thought Daniel Rodriguez won the fight personally then the fight before that Jesse Ronson Jesse Ronson coming into the UFC short notice UFC debut and he takes Dolby out in round one 
Then the fight before that, he beat Alex Oliveira. But if you remember back in that fight, the referee stood that fight up with Alex Oliveira on top of Dolby that, in my opinion, made the difference on that decision. It allowed Dolby to take over that fight because of the stand-up. So again, I think that was quite fortunate. And then before that, I mean, that Alex Oliveira fight was the return to the UFC for Dolby. Before that, Dolby had lost to Peter Sabota, Zach Cummins. He drew against Darren Till when Darren Till was still really green. So I'm just not convinced by the record of Dolby. He has had a few wins inside the UFC, but those haven't been entirely convincing where you actually look at his opponent here in Tim Means and Tim Means is the opposite. Even in his losses, he's looked okay. So Bilal Mohamed, he lost a split decision. Bilal Mohamed's a top fighter. Then Sergio Marias in Brazil, I think that Tim Means got robbed there. Nico Price, Tim Means was looking great until he just got cracked by the super aggressive Price. Tim Means also lost to Daniel Rodriguez as well. But again, that was a flash knockout in a fight where Tim Means was doing really well. And then Tim Means is on a two-fight win streak, Lariano Starapoli, which he controlled that fight and made that decisive in the end. Even though it was 1-1 going into round three, Tim Means turned it up when it mattered against Mike Perry. Tim Means had a bad first round. He had his back taken but he managed to get out of that bad position he managed to get back up to the feet and even though he lost that round he still got back up to his feet and then turned things around for the next two rounds and really started to piece Mike Perry up so even in defeat Tim Means looks good and he's on a two fight win streak now I do think that Dolby's gonna have paths to victory in this fight though I like the karate stance of Dolby the sideways stance for somebody that's a technical striker like Tim Means that's just going to create a little bit of more time for Tim Means to get his reads on Dolby, get his timing down and really start attacking himself. I do think he'll make those reads. It's just the sideways karate stance is really awkward to uh, really start getting going against. So I definitely think that's an advantage for Dolby in this fight. But I do think that once Tim Means gets those reads down gets his timing down and starts flowing with his striking, he's really going to look like the superior striker here. I think Dolby... His best path to victory once that starts happening is to level change and try and take Means down. But Means isn't the easiest fighter to take down. And if you do get him down, he can get back up to his feet. Even if you land in a really solid position and you take his back, he's patient, he'll bide his time and he'll get back up to his feet eventually. Tim Means is a really well-rounded fighter for as good as a striker as he actually is. But like I say, I think that the fight is going to be won and lost on the feet. If any fight is mixing things up and looking to take it in a different direction, like I've just mentioned, I do think that's going to be Dolby. I think Dolby will be shooting the takedowns. But I don't think Dolby is going to turn relentless in this fight. And if he doesn't have much success within his first few takedowns, I think that he's probably just going to let those takedowns pass. I think he's going to try and outstrike means and just fall short whilst doing so. And for me, it's almost one of those fights where I'm not going to be surprised if Dolby does actually come out of the fight with a win because he can be gritty. He is tough. He is durable. He'll never quit on himself and he'll just continue to push the fight for as long as it goes on. So he does have those qualities is if that's enough to beat Tim Means then like I said I'm not going to be surprised but when I'm looking at it from a style versus style perspective I don't think the takedowns are going to be as effective the top side grappling as effective I think the fight is going to have the better moments on the feet and that's where I feel that Tim Means is the better fighter if Dolby can really get the wrestling and grappling going here and he can start making the fight be on the mat for longer periods across the three rounds then Dolby is going to win this fight but I just don't think Means is going to allow that I think Means has felt and fought better wrestlers and better grapplers than Dolby and I think he's the better striker as well for those reasons I'm picking Tim Means to win this fight and in the next fight this one should be a fun one we've got Renato Moicano versus Jai Herbert Moicano is currently the minus 240 favorite the comeback on Herbert at plus 200 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line I don't see a lot of value if I'm being honest I do get the minus 240 favorite line of Renato Moicano but at the same time it's a little bit wide to be trusting a guy that's one and three in his last two years but we'll touch upon that really shortly I think the line is pretty fair I just don't see too much value in it as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week I do actually think that the money comes in on Jai Herbert a little bit more the current trend is that money coming in on him 
the line has shortened a little bit. I do think Herbert could potentially get to plus 175, plus 180. I just don't see it going much lower than that. That'd push Moicano to around minus 205, minus 210, which I think would be the brick wall there. And ultimately, that's where I think the betting line is going to close come fight night on Saturday night. Now, as for how this fight plays out, I think stylistically, it definitely favours Moicano. There's a reason why he's a minus 240 favourite. I just think that the trust issues with him are a genuine thing. But then you can counter that as well. So like I've already mentioned, he's 1-3 and three in his last four fights over the span of two years, the last two years, with his only win coming against Damir Hadjovic. Now, Damir Hadjovic is not at the level of Moicano, and that showed on the night. And although I do think that Jai Herbert would beat Hadjovic if they fought, I do think that they're in the same sort of ranking pools as each other. I don't think that Jai Herbert is head and shoulders above Hadjovic. I think they're in and around the same ranking pool, if that makes sense. So I do think that Moicano has got a good fight ahead of him. A bit of a step down in competition when you're comparing it to the likes of the Korean Zombie, Jose Aldo and Rafael Fiziev. So... It's definitely a better fight for Moicano is what I'm trying to say. I don't think it's going to be an easy fight. I think Jai Herbert makes it difficult for every single fighter he steps inside the cage with. Jai Herbert's tall, he's long, he's quick, he's constantly moving on his toes, in and out of range. And he's got the cardio to keep up with the pace that he puts on in fights as well, which is always really good to see. It's just when I'm looking at this fight from a style versus style perspective, who's the better striker? I think the striking's actually relatively close, if I'm being honest, but Moicano can definitely be more technical if we see the Moicano striking display that he put on against somebody like Calvin Cater then he's going to absolutely run through Jai Herbert it's just we haven't seen that performance from Moicano since that Cater fight it makes me wonder was that one of those fights where it's a career best performance for a fighter in this case being Moicano so when we're looking at the striking here I do think the striking is relatively close but then if this fight hits the mat, although again Jai Herbert's really difficult to deal with and control on the mat, I do think that Moicano is the better grappler here. I do think his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is better and I think it will show if the fight hits the mat. And honestly, this is where I'm having a hard time really picking Jai Herbert to win here to the point where I can't because I just think that Moicano is better in more areas in mixed martial arts. The one that we haven't spoken about is the wrestling, but I don't think either fighter is a great wrestler. So it's going to be a body lock trip or sneaking around the back, hopping on the back and getting the fight down that way type of thing, I think, if the fight does hit the mat. So it's going to take a bit of work in the game when you're looking at the clinch. Clinch. I think Jai Herbert's the more dangerous offensive striker in the clinch, but being the more effective fighter in regards to doing the right things technically, getting your underhooks and looking for trips and back takes, I just feel that Moicano is the better fighter in that position as well. I think that Jai Herbert could potentially hurt Moicano. Moicano's been hurt a lot. You know, those three losses that I talked about, he was knocked out by Fiziev, he was knocked out by the Korean Zombie, he was knocked out by Jose Aldo. So it wouldn't surprise me if all that has taken a toll and Herbert can land something on Moicano and knock him out that wouldn't shock me at all but when I'm looking at the quality in this fight and the style versus style perspective I just feel that Hanato Moicano is the better fighter pretty much wherever the fight's going to take place here for that reason I'm picking Hanato Moicano to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Danilo Marquez versus Kennedy and Zechikwu and Zechikwu is currently the minus 125 favourite the comeback on Marquez at plus 105 as the underdog as for where the value is on this betting line I think the betting line is actually quite close to the point where if you've got a good read on either fighter you're going to be able to find value in both especially with the plus money with Marquez but in regards to the analysis you can really make an argument for both fighters so if you read is high on Nzechikwu then at minus 125 you know that's a decent line to play as well now for me personally if you are going to push me for a value side I would say the value is with the favorite in Nzechikwu at minus 125 very slightly now as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week it's interesting actually because Nzechikwu was actually opened as the plus money underdog the money then came in on him after a couple of days of the line looking like it had settled with Nzechikwu round at plus 100 the line's now flipped and Nzechikwu is the favourite so I do think that that's the last flip that we see we'll get a little bit of fluctuation now but I really don't think that this betting line is going to get ridiculously wide and I don't think that as I've already mentioned we're going to see another line flip so ultimately I think the line is going to stay roughly where it's sitting right about now by the time both fighters step into the cage on Saturday night 
night. Now, as for how this fight plays out, like I said, you can make an argument for both guys. I think Marquez has surprised a lot of people in his opening two UFC fights, including myself, because he didn't look that dominant outside of the UFC. I don't think many people gave him a chance in the Ibrahimov fight. And then same thing happened in the Mike Rodriguez fight. And what Marquez did is he came in as an underdog. He went in there, he grinded wins out, he got takedowns. And his takedowns are okay, his wrestling could be improved, but it's good enough to score takedowns at this level, and at the level Kennedy and Zechakou's at as well. But he's got a really heavy top game with his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, to the point where it's very difficult to manoeuvre whilst you're under Marquez, and it's very difficult to stand back up. And if you do stand back up, Marquez will turn relentless with his wrestling, and he'll try and stick to his opponents until he gets them down. And that's because he knows that his striking wasn't on the level of his previous two opponents and the thing is he's getting the same fight here with Nzechukwu. Nzechukwu is going to be a tall fighter. Marquez has got an inch on him but the reach, the length of Nzechukwu is going to allow Nzechukwu to be able to fight on the outside at range firing in and ultimately staying away from the close quarters that Marquez will be looking to hit in order to try and land his takedowns. So Marquez has got the same fight here. He knows he's not going to be able to strike with Nzechukwu and win this fight. So he's going to be relentless. He's going to come in. He's going to try and take Nzechukwu down. Now Nzechukwu is more of a volume-based striker rather than a power puncher. So I don't think Marquez is going to have to worry about getting cracked with something hard coming in. I think he's going to be able to get into that range and take Nzechukwu down. The thing is, Nzechukwu is not an easy fighter to take down. He's got a 78% takedown defense statistic, which is quite high. And a lot of fighters try and take him down because of his height, because of his range and his reach. So it's nothing new to Nzechukwu. Nzechukwu is going to see things from Marquez in this fight that he's seen in pretty much every other fight that he's fought in the UFC. And I just feel that it's going to come down to can Marquez get the takedowns and the top control or does he tire himself out trying? And I kind of think that Marquez has gas tank issues that we just haven't seen yet because fighters haven't been able to put up a tough enough test defending plenty of takedowns and making him work and work and work. And I think that's actually what happens in this fight. I think Nzechukwu is going to probably get taken down once or twice, but I think he's going to be able to get back to his feet maybe on the first few attempts and then just stuff takedowns from then on and I think that is going to cause Marquez to look more towards the wrestling to continue to force takedowns ultimately that's going to tire him out each takedown attempt that he fails that Nzechukwu defends and then once Marquez is really tired Nzechukwu is going to be able to land strikes in the clinch when Marquez has closed the distance or it's going to allow Nzechukwu's speed and his movement to just play a bigger factor in this fight where he can stay in range and start really piling the volume on Marquez and I think that's where Nzechukwu is going to win this fight and I think that's the more likely way of this fight playing out as well. I definitely think Nzechukwu has got his work cut out for him in this fight in regards to defending takedowns but I think he can defend the takedowns. I think he can keep this fight vertical, tire Marquez out and just out volume him on the way to a decision if he doesn't finish him late on as well. I think that Nzechukwu has got a decent fight for himself here. I'm picking Kennedy and Nzechukwu to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Michel Prezeres returning from a two-year USADA suspension versus Shavkat Rakhmonov. Rakhmonov is currently the minus 275 favourite. The comeback on Prezeres at plus 235 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, it's a real shame to say because Michel Prezeres was one of my early money trains when I started gambling in MMA. I absolutely loved Prezeres. He'd fight for your money. He was solid and he would just win and cash your tickets for you. So I love Prezeres, but those were times that are long gone, in my opinion now. Shavkat Ratmonov, I feel, is definitely the better bet at minus 275 than Prezeres at plus 235. I think there's a lot of stylistic advantages for Ratmonov. I think there's a lot of physical advantages. And also, Ratmonov isn't the fighter coming off a two-year layoff due to a USADA suspension either. So I think that the value is with Ratmonov in this fight. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, I actually think... Think that the betting line is going to get wider as well. I don't think there's going to be too many people wanting to play Prezeras at plus 235. Now, Prezeras is still a really skilled fighter, which I'll talk about very shortly. But like I said, when you're taking everything into consideration, along with Ratmonov being a bit of a hype train as well, it's difficult to see this line closing up. I think Ratmonov's going to be in a lot of parlays. I think people might even play him straight as well. So I think the betting line is going to get wider. I think Ratmonov will be closer to minus 350 come fight night on Saturday night. Now, as for how this fight plays out, 
it's not just the fact that Prezaris has had a layoff. It's not just the fact that he is getting older and he's not looking like the fighter he used to be. But when you look at his last fight against Nordiev, Nordiev really dominated that fight when you look back at it. And Nordiev didn't really do too much after that fight in the UFC to the point where he got caught. He's now outside the UFC and it's not looking too great for him, unfortunately. He is a young fighter, Nordiev. I hope he can come back and, you know, improve and develop. But when you look at where Nordiev is now and then you consider that Prezera has lost to that fighter before the USADA suspension, it doesn't look good for Prezeras. And when you actually look at Rakmonov, Rakmonov is very similar to Nordiev in regards to style, except Rakmonov is just better, in my opinion, than Nordiev in every single area. I think he's a better striker. I think he's a better wrestler, a better grappler. He's more dangerous. He's got finishing ability. If he doesn't finish a fight, then obviously the style allows him to dominate and look good on the scorecards as well. And I feel that Prezeras has got his hands full here wherever the fight goes. Now, for Prezeras to win this fight, he's got to get takedowns, he's got to get top control of Rakmonov and either control the fight on the mat for long periods or try and find a submission. And actually, either is possible for Prezeras. If Prezeras can actually get on top of Rakmonov, he's definitely going to give himself a good chance of winning this fight. But if he doesn't get Rakmonov out, I just don't think that his cardio is going to hold out against someone as active and someone as quick and tricky as Rakmonov. I think that Rakmonov is a ball of energy in his fights he's a good striker he's explosive he's aggressive he's good in the clinch he can look for takedowns he's got good top control as well and then when you look at the physical differences in this fight you've got Rakmonov who's got a six inch height advantage he's got a 10 inch reach advantage he's also younger by 13 years as well a fighter that is entering his prime opposed to Prezeres who is way past his prime and you know he's closer to the end of his career than what he is to the start of it so when you put in everything together it's really difficult to see Prezeres coming out of this fight with his hand raised I do think that Rakmonov could win a decision quite comfortably. I also think Rakmonov could finish Prezeras. I think that's the most likely outcome potentially with a knockout opposed to a submission. But I just think Rakmonov's going to be way too much for Prezeras. I think it's a really bad fight stylistically for Prezeras physically for Prezeres to come back to after a two-year layoff. I'm picking Shavkat Ratmonov to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Wally Alves versus the newcomer, Jeremiah Wells. We should have actually had Alves versus Ramazan Amiv, which I'm disappointed Amiv pulled out because I really liked him there. But we've got a good replacement in Wells and I'm excited for this fight. Wally Alves is currently the minus 230 favourite. The comeback on Wells at plus 190 as the underdog. Now, as for where the value is on the betting line, I don't think there's too much value, if I'm being honest, because I think, again, the line is quite accurate and it really is difficult because trusting Wally Alves as a minus 230 favourite is probably not the way to go but then after analysing Wells and his game and his style plus 190 again it's probably not wide enough that you want to take that dog shot on him either so it's a difficult one I don't see too much value if you are going to push me for it I would still probably say that Wally Alves at minus 230 is very slightly the better bet than Wells at plus 190 and as for where the betting line moves throughout five week again I don't think there's going to be too much action on this fight as a whole I think there might be a few people that will parlay Wally Alves just because he is the more experienced fighter that will probably widen the line a little bit maybe take Alves to minus 250 but I don't think it's going to get any greater than that and I also don't think Alves is going to drop below minus 200 either as for how this fight plays out though Jeremiah Wells he's a decent fighter he's a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu under Daniel Gracie which is obviously the same black belt as the likes of Sean Brady and Sean Brady and Wells train together as well they're both under Daniel Gracie so you can really see that Wells has got a very similar style to Brady as well he's okay on the feet he's explosive not too active but then he will look for takedowns and once he's on the mat he can be quite dominant but this is where I think Wells is going to run into trouble because he's not that active on the feet apart from being explosive in bursts and he also thrives more moving forward than moving backwards. When he's pushed backwards, he becomes extremely inactive to the point where he's almost not throwing anything at all. And I don't think Alves is going to allow Wells just to blitz forward and wing big bombs at him, which is what Wells likes to do. And actually, if Wells comes out in this fight and just thinks, you know what, it's my debut, I'm going to meet fire with fire. If I get knocked out trying, then so be it. Then 
he's going to have a good chance of knocking Alves out early. But I think Alves has experienced the fact that he's been in there with much better quality competition. I think he's really going to pay off for him in this fight. I think if Alves does start getting Wells moving backwards, then it's Alves's fight to lose. And if Wells starts trying to take Alves down, then he's going to run the risk of potentially putting himself in danger as well. Because let's not forget that Wally Alves is a legit Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt as well with a solid guillotine. He guillotined Colby Covington at a time when nobody could beat him. So, you know, that says it all. I think overall, Wells' best path to victory here is that puncher's chance, bursting forwards and really starting to put it on Alves early in this fight. But I think Alves will be just as strong doing the same type of thing to Wells, pushing forwards. And if these two both collide in the middle early on in this fight, no fighter wants to take a step backwards, but both fighters want to land a big heavy shot, then it, literally it could end with any fighter unconscious at that point that way the line would not be a reflection of how the fight plays out but I think the longer this fight plays out I think the better it's going to be for Alves who should be able to just pick Jeremiah Wells apart for three rounds he'll have to defend a few takedowns but he could defend with a really solid guillotine attack and that solid guillotine attack will not only defend the takedown but probably prevent Wells from shooting in later down the line as well I just think that the line's accurate I think the bookies understand that Wells has got some holes especially with inactivity I think that's really going to hurt him in this fight I'm picking Wally Alves to win this fight and in the next fight we've got a really odd fight in my opinion we've got Marcin Pracnow versus Ike Villanueva Pracnow is currently the minus 190 favorite the comeback on Villanueva at plus 165 as the underdog as for where the value is on the betting line you probably got to say the values with Pracnow at minus 190 considering his last performance which I'll touch upon very shortly and then considering Villanueva hasn't really looked great in the UFC but still at minus 190 how much value does that hold based on one last performance you know I'm not too sure but yeah at minus 190 I think it's the better bet than Villanueva at plus 165 as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week the current trend is the money coming in on Villanueva which I kind of get and I don't get at the same time like I say, it's just a really odd fight. I think that the betting line will close a little bit. I think we'll see Pratniow enter the cage, minus 175, minus 180, with Villanueva being roughly around the plus 150 line. Now, as for how this fight plays out, like I say, Marcin Pratniow, he hasn't looked good in the UFC until his last fight out against Khalil Roundtree, where he just looked like an absolute monster, and he looked nothing like what we've seen previously from him in the UFC. He landed over 100 strikes in three rounds, against Khalil Roundtree, he ate punches from Roundtree that would have knocked him out in any other fight, to the point where even I'm there questioning, thinking, has Pracnyao got on the juice? Has he got something inside of him that's helping him out? But obviously USADA will have done all the tests and stuff like that and nothing's come back, so maybe it's just developments from Pracnyao, maybe he just had a career best performance, I don't know, but you've got to base it on what you see in tape, and in Pracnyao's last fight, he was durable, he was active, he fought through cardio issues, he got volume in there, a tremendous triple digit amount of volume in three rounds, which not many fighters can do, especially in the heavier weight divisions. And then on the other side of the cage, you've got Ike Villanueva, he lost to Chase Sherman, he lost to Jordan Wright, got knocked out in both of those fights. Then he made difficult work, to be fair, of Vinicius Mejia, who at this point has a blueprint on him, which makes him probably one of the easiest fighters to beat in the division. I don't mean any disrespect, I just mean that, you know, that blueprint is out there on him that makes it so easy for an opponent. And Villanueva, he did it in the second round, he knocked him out, but the first round, like I said, he made difficult work of it. Then you look at the strikes landed per minute, 3.62, he absorbs 6.93, nearly seven strikes absorbed per minute he eats a lot of strikes and I think if Pratniow can put on a similar type of performance as he put on last time against Khalil Roundtree this fight is going to be much easier for him than what the Roundtree fight was because Villanueva is really hittable I think Pratniow is going to be the faster fighter as well and if he keeps his movement good and stays out the way of big punches from Villanueva he should be able to get the win but on the same token I wouldn't be surprised if that was just a one-off performance last time out from Pratniow Villanueva 
Villanueva comes in there and he hits him with one big hard punch that knocks him out. Ultimately just showing that the durability issues are back for Pratniow. But like I say, I'm basing it from what I've seen in tape. The last fight I saw, Pratniow looked really good. He looked developed. He's obviously not had any issues with USADA as well. So maybe he is just an improving fighter and he's worked on a lot of things. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm picking Marcin Pratniow to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Julia Avila versus Julia Stolyarenko, a fight that should have happened a few months ago. Avila's currently the minus 345 favourite, the comeback on Stolyarenko at plus 285 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I understand why Avila is a favourite in this fight, but I think the betting line's too wide at minus 345. I think the fight could potentially play out much closer than that. But with that being said, you do have to pick your spots to fade fighters like Julia Avila, and I'm not sure this is the right fight to pick to fade her, so the plus 285 on Stolyarenko probably isn't as appetizing. I think if you're pushing me for a value side, I think that value is the wrong word to use here, but the minus 345 line on Avila is probably the better bet, potentially in a parlay, than the plus 285 of Stolyarenko. As for where the betting line moves throughout fight week, the current trend is the money on Stolyarenko closing the line up a little bit. I do agree with that trend. I just don't know how short this betting line can get. I don't think we're going to see Avila at minus 300. I think if she hits minus 300, she'll just be steamed back to roughly where she's sitting right about now. And that is also why I think that the betting lines will stay roughly where they are now come fight night on Saturday night. Now, as for how this fight plays out, I do understand why Avila is wide on the betting line here because, and I say this a lot, when both fighters step into the cage and they've got very similar styles, they're both well-rounded and they're both good everywhere, pretty much identical fighters from a stylistic perspective, but one fighter's better in every single area, that's why you get the wide betting lines because although the styles are similar, even if one fighter's only slightly better in every area, it still means that that fighter's just going to be able to edge out every single round and it doesn't matter where the fight's going to go and that's what makes the lines wide and I do sense that that's the scenario in this fight because Stolyarenko can strike but I think Avila is just the better polished striker and the fighter that's more likely to be aggressive pushing Stolyarenko back and then Stolyarenko fights much better going forwards than backwards so that instantly gives Avila an advantage and an edge on the feet now when you're looking at the wrestling I think again both fighters can wrestle but Avila's again slightly more aggressive she's more physical she's the fighter that's likely going to be pushing her opponent back to the cage so she can get in those dominant clinch positions and get the fight down to the mat so again in regards to the wrestling I do think that Avila has an edge there as well and then in regards to the jiu-jitsu I think if Avila's on top of Stolyarenko I don't think Stolyarenko is going to pose too many threats off a back so this is what I mean about the fact that the betting line is where it is for a reason and that is because I think Avila is just going to be better in every single area she's going to be more aggressive she's going to be the one pushing forwards getting the cage control time dictating the pace of the fight dictating the range and it should just be a relatively simple night for her however at this level in the UFC all it takes is one bad night one off night from a fighter which can happen Avila did that against Eubanks she went in there a big favorite against Eubanks fell short with a bad night if Stolyarenko looks good that night suddenly that minus 345 line becomes laughable and that type of thing can happen like I said at this level in the UFC but ultimately I do think that when I'm looking at the skill set of each opponent and the style versus style matchup I think Avila is going to come out on top I'm picking Julia Avila to win this fight and in the next fight, we've got Charles Rosa versus Justin Janes. Rosa is currently the minus 170 favourite. The comeback on Janes at plus 150 as the underdog. As for where the value is on the betting line, I do think the value sits slightly with Charles Rosa at minus 170. And to be honest, with the way I look at Charles Rosa, I'm not massively high on him. So I see minus 170 as a big line to play on somebody that I'm not massively high on. But a few years ago, I created a phrase, I created a saying that I do stand by. And that's your fighter doesn't need to be great they only need to be better than the opponent that's in front of them and that does absolutely reflect what we've got right here because like i've already mentioned i'm not massively high on rosa 
but at the same time I'm even less high on Justin James so yeah for me back to the value minus 170 on Charles Rosa is the value side in my opinion as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week again I just don't think it's going to ping off in any one direction I think there's going to be a little bit of fluctuation and if anything I do think the line's going to shorten up a bit because I also feel that other people will think well minus 170 for Charles Rosa who isn't a totally dominant fighter is a big line as well and they might just play on the power punch of Justin James and it'll close the line up a little bit but again I don't think it's going to move too much either way ultimately when they step into the cage on Saturday night I expect the betting line to be roughly where it's sitting right about now now as for how this fight plays out I think Justin James has got one clear path to victory here and that's to land one of his punches he does pack power especially in that first round and knock Charles Rosa out the thing is with Charles Rosa is he doesn't really get knocked out he's only really been stopped by Shane Burgos in a fight that he was winning on the scorecards up until that third round knockout as well and that was in a striking fight now Charles Rosa isn't the most technical fighter he's not the most technical striker should I say but he's effective with what he does throw and when judges are scoring fights they're not scoring on technique they're scoring on effective striking what's landing they don't care what that strike looks like what the punch looks like is it a good straight punch is it a sloppy punch they don't care they just look at is it landing is it causing damage and that really summarizes Rosa's striking because it's not technical but it's effective he'll just throw things out there that'll land and for someone like Justin James that's got to get inside into that boxing range swing hard and swing off and at Rosa's chin to get the finish I just think it's going to be difficult for him to do Rosa's got two stances he's got the karate sideways stance but then he's got more of an orthodox boxing stance and he'll switch between them both and whilst he's in the karate stance I think he's going to cause a lot of problems for somebody like James trying to close that distance and get inside to the point where I just think it's going to frustrate James and then you can talk about James's wrestling background but again the wrestling that he used was more on the regional scene it hasn't really translated into the UFC either which does normally tell me that a fighter probably isn't UFC caliber and I don't mean any disrespect with that I just feel that aside from that debut knockout of Frank Camacho Justin James has just fell short in every single fight afterwards sure he's had some moments and that's actually the only thing that does worry me in this fight for Rosa because James might have that moment in this fight where he catches Rosa and knocks him out but outside of that I think Rosa outclasses him in every single area from a striking perspective again it's not going to look pretty but it'll be effective from Rosa and if the fight does hit the mat even if Rosa's on his back even if he does give up a takedown I just expect Rosa to be much better in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu in the grappling to be able to either sweep reverse position or to stand back up to his feet or potentially submit Justin James from bottom I don't think James has got a heavy top game especially not at this level it's a difficult fight for him and one that I don't think he's going to win so I'm picking Charles Rosa to win this fight and in the final breakdown of this episode we've got a fight that should have happened a couple of weeks ago we've got Yancy Medeiros versus Damir Hadzovic Hadzovic is currently the minus 140 favourite the comeback on Medeiros at plus 120 as the underdog now as for where the value is on the betting line it's a little strange actually because the reason they didn't fight a couple of weeks ago they both weighed in but Hadzovic had health issues and ultimately had to withdraw from the fight with the doctors just simply not clearing him to fight so the fact that it was a pick -em last time out a minus 110 pick -em on either side and now we've got Hadzovic up at minus 140 when he was the one that had the health issues it does beg the question of why and because of that I am actually going with the value being on Yancy Medeiros at plus 120. I think the minus 110 picking was the right line and if Medeiros was actually a minus 120, minus 125 favourite because of Hadjovic's health issues I'd understand that but the fact that Medeiros is plus 120 I do feel that he's now the value side on the betting line. Now as for where the betting line moves throughout fight week I actually don't think it's going to move too much from here. The line is sort of settled it's not really moved too much in the last few days so I don't expect it to just kick off and ping in any particular direction I think it's going to be roughly where it is right about now when both fighters have stepped into the cage on Saturday night I just don't think there's going to be a ton of action on this fight if I'm being honest and as for how this fight plays out I'm not really going to change any of the analysis from last time I think that both fighters have shown good moments in the UFC I think both fighters have shown lackluster moments where they could have been better I think the fight's potentially going to be won and lost on the feet as well but I do think that we might see some takedowns being mixed in potentially from both sides as well 
neither fighter is a massively beast wrestler they don't really relentless in that respect either but both will shoot reactive takedowns if they see an opportunity an opportunistic takedown they will take it and the top game's decent grappling wise but I almost think that the bottom games aren't bad either, but whoever's on top is going to be the one having success and will be able to nullify the bottom game of either fighter. The thing is, I don't think the wrestling, the takedowns and the grappling is going to have too much of an effect on this fight should the fight go to the scorecards. I also don't think we see a finish on the mat either, which does push me towards believing the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet. And in that respect, you've got two fighters that are really good strikers. I think Hadjovic is more dynamic because he'll mix in a lot more kicks. His angles that he takes on his strikes are a little bit more polished as well. He's just a more polished striker. But Medeiros is a striker that will come forwards. He'll eat punches. He's durable. He's got that Hawaiian blood where it's just hard to knock those dudes out. And he'll just keep waning forward and he'll just push out, pour out strikes into his opponent's face and just really make life difficult but again when the fight's going to be won and lost on the feet I do think it's going to be relatively close with both of the styles but I do favour the style of the more dynamic striker the fighter that will mix in kicks the fighter that does take up better angles and the fighter that does look slightly more technically polished and that's Hadjovic so for that reason I am going to pick Damir Hadjovic to win this fight and that's all for this episode of on the money line i hope you all enjoyed it and as always fight fans i'd appreciate all the likes to the video and subscriptions to our mma play 365 youtube channel too remember you can get all the better advice you'll ever need over at mmaplay365.com we cater for long-term gamblers that like to build their own bets and strategies gamblers that just want to follow exactly what i bet on and we also cater for you fun gamblers that like the long shot fun parlays or hackers accumulators as we call them in the UK. Even if you only want our best value underdog for the event, which comes with a money back guarantee by the way, we have plenty of different packages and subscription options for you guys to choose from, which also includes our DFS packages for DraftKings and FanDuel as well. All our subscriptions are at very affordable prices. Just hop on to MMAplay365.com and see what's best for you. Thank you all for listening and we'll see you at the next event.